I'd like to welcome everyone to the Child Health Research Institute's 19th Annual Pediatric Research Forum, the, inve the event in which our investigators and trainee researchers share their most recent research projects. This year, like last, we are meeting virtually in order to be safe and healthy. We, of course, look forward to being able to meet again in person, but I think you will find that despite being remote, we will have ample opportunity to learn and connect at this year's forum. Uh, CME information is available on the current slide, and we will be putting that, I think, in the chat, the event code in the chat here shortly. So if you uh, are not um, able to get that uh, done quickly, uh, don't worry, you can just find that information in the chat as we move forward. I'd like to take a second to draw everyone's attention to the poster site please make sure to log in to the virtual event site to interact with the investigators research posters and abstracts. There you can leave comments and questions and those are uh, really highlights for those investigators who worked so hard to present their uh, research. It's a way that we can have uh, interaction and exchange of ideas, uh, even if it is asynchronous. Uh, those of you with UNMC email addresses can log in directly with your credentials and others can create a basic login account for the site within a few minutes. If you have any issues logging in, please contact uh, chri at unmc.edu uh, and send them an email. The site also features work from the Pediatric Honors Program and the Medicinal Musings Artistic Submissions. This evening, we will hear from two keynote speakers, Drs. Kate Heelan and Gwen Scar, and then move into our trainee and Medicinal Musings Award ceremony around 5.30. Please remember to join us tomorrow, starting with Grand Rounds at 8 a.m. featuring Dr. Rachel Marlowe, and then followed by the Medical Student and Teaching Awards. Please note that tomorrow's event has a different Zoom link that you can find in your event email. The Zoom etiquette for the day is a little bit different than last year. We are using a Zoom webinar instead of a Zoom meeting. So you will want to use the chat function, which I think most of us are accustomed to, or the question and answer function to communicate with the speakers and ask questions. And we'll be uh, watching for those questions so that we can have a nice interaction. You won't be able to unmute yourself in this event. All right, with all of those housekeeping duties underway, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kate Heelan. Dr. Heelan is a PhD, a professor in exercise science at the University of Nebraska Kearney. Dr. Heelan teaches exercise science classes in fitness, evaluation, exercise physiology, research methods, and advanced exercise physiology. She is the director of the Physical Activity and Wellness Lab, a state-of-the-art 9,000 square foot facility. The mission of the Physical Activity and Wellness Lab is to address the obesity epidemic by providing expertise in community programs and initiatives aimed at increasing physical activity and healthy eating behaviors across the lifespan. Dr. Heelan has been recognized as a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine for her research endeavors in the field of exercise science. She greatly enjoys mentoring undergraduate and graduate students in the research process. Dr. Heelan will be speaking on the adaptions of an effective evidence-based pediatric weight management intervention for implementation into rural and micropolitan communities. We'll take a couple of minutes at the end of Dr. Heelan's uh, presentation uh, for questions, so please enter them as the presentation goes along in the question and answer session. Dr. Heelan, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Okay, well, I appreciate the invitation to speak to everyone today. Um, as it was mentioned, I'm going to be speaking about a pediatric weight management program that we have here. Um, in the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and I'm going to talk about how we've expanded that across um, the state and hopefully further expansion. Um, I'd like to start by first introducing our team. Um, we definitely have a multidisciplinary, multi campus team. Um, Jenny Hill from UNMC is the co PI on the current grant, um, and we have collaborators mainly from UNK and UNMC. Um, on the team that I want to make sure I acknowledge. So just to um, get things started, I want to talk, um, we're all very familiar with the obesity trends. And so this is nothing new to anybody, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page as to when I'm talking about pediatric obesity treatment, 
I'm talking about um, our program works with six to 11 year olds. And this would be the green bar as we've seen over the last several decade. We know that we've seen a continual climb in obesity. And when we talk about the obesity trends, we're talking about children with a BMI greater than the 95th percentage according to the CDC growth charts. And so just to make sure again that we're all on the same page, um, if we're looking at BMI and age, as we um, look at the growth charts, the average child about the 50th percentile, we're working with children greater than the 95th percentile. And so in this pink area, these would be um, children from, again, six to 12 years of age with BMIs greater than the 95th percentile, which according to um, the experts in pediat American Academy of Pediatrics, that's the population that weight loss is recommended for. And we all know that there are definitely reasons why we need to um, work with these children. The health risks associated with childhood obesity are outstanding. And I, I've seen this for years, but it isn't until I work with an eight-year-old whose HDL cholesterols are low and their blood pressure is high and they have asthma that it really hits home that weight loss can make a significant um, impact on their day-to-day -day quality of life and health. So where we are located, um, this is a map of Nebraska, and this is a population density map. And so we know that Omaha and Lincoln, the lighter colored areas are where we have urban uh, metropolitans. However, the rest of the state is quite a bit darker where it's considered rural or micropolitan area. Where Kearney is located is here in Buffalo County, and we're in what's considered to be a micropolitan, meaning that where our pediatricians draw from, about a 50 mile radius, um, it's about a population total of a little over 50,000. And so up until 10 years ago, if we had an obese child who had some health indicators, we would have to send them either out to Denver, to Children's Hospital, Omaha, Lincoln has, has a program as well, or to Kansas City. But that's really unrealistic to think that families can attend an intensive program when we're talking 130 to 200 miles away, 300 miles away. And so we really wanted to implement a program here in our rural community that could be effective. Another thing that's really um, started my interest over the years is data that I've collected on elementary school age children. This represents weight gain of students in one year. And so this was a population of kindergarten to fourth grade students, mean age of eight, who um, we tracked year to year. And children within the normal weight category, so in a BMI um, growth chart, we're looking at anywhere from the fifth to the 84th, 85th percentile, they're gaining about seven and a half to eight pounds in a year. Normal growth and maturation, we expect children to gain weight. Overweight kids, those between the 85th and 95th percentile for BMI, were gaining 12 pounds per year. And those children greater than the 95th percentile were gaining closer to 17 pounds per year. So, you know, double the amount of weight in one year. As you look at this data, my premise has always been, if we can get children who are, who are dealing with overweight and obesity to gain less weight, to attenuate excessive weight gain, they can actually grow into their weight as they get taller. And so I've done a lot of work um, within the area, building a community approach to pediatric obesity prevention and treatment. And so what I wanted to do today was just to kind of take you through what we've done here um, to, in a community approach, to really uh, emphasize both prevention as well as treatment. And so back in 2002, I implemented what's called a walking school bus program. Um, I was a young uh, assistant professor who was very interested in increasing physical activity as a mechanism for attenuating excessive weight gain. And so I paid college students to walk a route to and from schools, elementary schools, each and every day. And we did this for three years. And so very similar to a school bus, 
we would set a route a mile away from the school and actually each, each school had about five or six different routes and a college student would walk the children um, a certain route to school, picking kids up along the way. And then at the end of the day, they would walk a route home, dropping kids off along the way. We found that kids who walked regularly gained less weight over time. We also then implemented a BMI report card within our school systems. The um, school nurses were already collecting height and weight, but they weren't doing anything with that data. And so we created a BMI report card as a mechanism just to increase parental awareness of their child's weight status and weight gain each year. It trends over time. Uh, we don't use the word overweight, no obese. We just simply are talking about weight gain over time and um, ways to prevent excessive weight gain. Having this data, um, because we had data on every single child every year, we were able to evaluate the different programs that we were implementing, as well as apply for several grants. So along with the public schools, we received a physical education program grant in 2008, which um, is a federal grant. And our goal was to increase physical activity and decrease obesity. So this was a prevention program. Um, well, it, I'm sorry, it allowed us to do several prevention programs at both the district level and individual school level. And so we were able to impact a large proportion of children within the schools. However, there's still that missing piece. What about these children who already have obesity? How can we help them? So we also uh, implemented what was called Building Healthy Families um, at the community level. It's actually a pediatric uh, weight management program. And so we implemented that in 2009. And so today I really wanna talk about building healthy families, but I think it's really important to show it's part of the big picture. There isn't one specific thing we've done, but we've done multiple things over time and continuously as a way to uh, impact the prevalence of overweight and obesity. So back in 2006, when we started the BMI report card, an area physician um, in about 2009, he approached me and said, if a pediatrician was very concerned if we're going to uh, make parents aware of their child's weight status, we need to be able to offer them a program um, locally to help them with that problem. And one parent once told me, you know, if a school sent home a report card telling me that my child was having strep, a was struggling with reading, I would get them a reading tutor. And so it was very similar. If we're gonna tell a parent that their child's weight is high, we wanna be able to help them locally. And so we took a community approach. Um, we found who was interested within our community. Luckily, we had a very active um, County Health Advisory Committee. The Buffalo County Community Partners were very interested in adult obesity and so had some interest in working with children as well. We had our local pediatrician who was very interested in doing more for the, the children, our parks and recreation program, public schools, as well as the university. And I think the message here really is that building healthy family, families was not created in a vacuum. It was part of an overall initiative. Um, it, the initiative included primary prevention, secondary prevention, and then the treatment program, the tertiary prevention or treatment. We also really wanted to focus um, on a horizontal system-based approach. And so instead of a top-down approach to where the CEO of the hospital is saying, we will do this program and figure out how to do it, we really wanted to get a team together and have a team, multiple sectors of the community have buy into our program. So our pediatrician became our medical director. We found a dietitian within the community. Um, she was a community educator, had a lot of interest with teaching children. We found a behavioral psychologist at our Carney Clinic. Um, I'm the exercise scientist who was involved. And then we brought on a physical educator onto our team. And so knowing that we wanted to implement a program, I went to the um, data and I wanted to be able to find an a, a program that has um, evidence of effectiveness. And so we looked at Epstein. Uh, Leonard Epstein has been doing pediatric obesity treatment programs since the 70s. And it's probably the most studied pediatric weight management intervention that has demonstrated efficacy across a wide range of randomized control trials. 
and he also worked with six to 12 year olds. Um, so Building Healthy Families is an adaptation of his work. And just to demonstrate how we adapted this program, um, I used the Adaptone from Chambers and Norton to demonstrate the, the key components that we adapted. And so over here on the left, we have Epstein's key components. Um, the intervention, these are the different um, components of adaptation and then our Building Healthy Families program. I understand there's a lot on the slide and a lot to see, so I'll just go through a few things. Uh, one thing was that Epstein had a multi multidisciplinary team. Uh, he had a behavioral therapist, a dietitian, pediatrician. They worked in a laboratory and they had federal funding. We formed a very similar team, but we worked in the community and we had local funding. He targeted children six to 12 years of age with a BMI greater than the 95th percentile. And we did the same. Um, we also, he did family-based and we wanted to also do family-based programming. Um, our program met weekly for 90 minutes, 12 sessions. So for three months, they met weekly. And then we had follow-up sessions, refresher sessions out to the six month. One adaptation that we did is, um, technology advancements. So, you know, over time we've gone through writing down how much activity we get to being able to use step counters to wearable activity monitors. So we've done some technology enhancements. We've done this all in a rural community and we've really used the key components that Epstein used. Um, elimination of red foods, which I'll explain what those are in a moment. Goal setting, nutrition education, behavior modifications such as self-monitoring, stimulus control, goal setting, <clears throat> and then physical activity. So we've adapted the key components of his program into what is now Building Healthy Families. So it's a pediatric weight management program with the three components of physical, physical activity, nutrition education, and lifestyle modification. Uh, families come 12 to 12 sessions weekly. Each session is about a two hour time commitment. So it's quite the commitment um, and it is family-based. So we ask that everybody in the family comes each week to the program. We do assessments at baseline in 12 weeks and then we have follow-up and some relapse prevention out to six months. So our program goals, um, again, are adapted from Epstein's program and the American Academy of Pediatricians pediatricians um, has suggested that weight loss be gradual and slow. So children were looking for a half pound to one pound, one pound per week. Um, adults, one to two pounds. We want physical activity to be realistic. And so we could say 10,000 steps is easy for everybody to get, but a lot of our parents, that's unrealistic. A lot of our kids are already active. Um, we don't want weekend warriors. So we we really focused on people being active five out of seven days per week. So based on wherever they started, we just want them to increase activity, but we want them to be active daily. And then with red foods, red foods are high calorie, high fat foods. We teach kids how to identify those and then limit the number of servings. So at the beginning of the pro program, we assume that families are eating or individuals are eating approximately red eight, red servings of food a day. And we ask them to decrease that to where they're eating no more than two servings of red foods per day. And this is all based off of the traffic light eating plan, which is an, uh, modified from Epstein. And again, at the top here, you can see red, yellow, and green, or red, yellow, and green. Um, green foods are foods that you can be eaten without concern. So your fruits, your vegetables, eat as much as you would like. Yellow foods, things we wanna eat in moderation. And then we teach children to identify red foods, foods with greater than 200 calories per serving, greater than five grams of fat. If we're talking cereal, we're looking at the sugar content, but we're really looking, it, it is a low fat eating plan, but we're wanting them to eat healthy. And so um, we never completely restrict our red foods. We try to get down to two red foods a day. And you'd be amazed at how kids grasp on to this concept. They absolutely love it. Each week we do nutrition education that focuses on different ways to learn how to um, identify foods. And we always do hands-on fun activities that are geared towards the children. 
Some results that we've seen after nine cohorts, um, we, we've had 91 families initiate participation, 75 families completed 12 weeks, which is 82% of our families, which is awesome. And 60% of those families returned at six months for assessment. Our child participants, um, the average age was about nine and a half and their average BMI was at baseline was the 97th percentile. So we are hitting our obese children. Or um, our BMI Z-score change at 12 weeks is negative 0.26. So if you're into BMI Z-score changes, this is huge. Um, I'll show you some body composition data in a second, which um, is outstanding. But we've also seen changes in um, systolic blood pressure increases in HDL cholesterol, and decreases in AST liver enzymes. And those are all statistically significant. With our body composition changes, our blue is our body mass, our weight. And then we do have DEXA data on all of these children at baseline 12 weeks and six months. And so we can see uh, changes in fat mass as well as increases in fat-free mass. So at 12 weeks, our children lost close to five and a half pounds, a little over five and a half pounds, but really they're lost closer to six pounds of fat and gained a pound of muscle. And so we know as we lose weight, we're gonna lose muscle and fat. Well, with children, what's outstanding is you can actually increase that lean muscle mass as well as decreasing fat. So as, as you might think, well, five and a half pounds isn't much. Remember that these are nine-year-old children. That's about 5% of their body mass. So that's outstanding. What's even more important um, is after the weekly sessions, we saw them periodically out to six months. So from the 12 month mark out to the six month mark, they weren't attending weekly. However, they continued to lose weight and they continued to lose fat and increase muscle. So the behaviors were behaviors that they could continue. They didn't end at the end of the intervention. So some implications for dissemination and implementation is that our effectiveness data shows that we can adapt a program such as Epstein's, which was developed in a lab and we can implement it in a community setting in a rural community. And so our next step was to determine ways that we could expand this program. We applied for funding from the Centers for Disease Control and along with four other institutions across the nation we have been funded to be part of what they call their CORD3 project. It's Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration Project. And um, so we're Nebraska CORD3. And just to give you a quick overview of the project, um, the whole project is to develop a train the trainer package. And so taking Building Healthy Families and creating a digital training package that other communities can take and learn everything they need to learn about implementing a program. They can adopt the program and implement it within their own community. Part of the grant was to identify communities and pilot test our program that we've packaged. We're just starting year three of this grant. We have developed our the train the trainer program and we have identified seven communities to implement the program. Those seven communities have been randomized into two different approaches. Half the communities will get just get the program and implement it, and we'll see if it's effective or not. Uh, the other communities will go through a learning collaborative where we'll provide assistance and some more education along with the training package. Um, I'd love to say that these communities are implementing the program as is, or right now. Um, we should be actually finishing up. However, with COVID, they were unable to do that, and so two communities just recently started the program and the rest of them will wait till fall, hoping that the restrictions have gone down enough that they can implement the program. Um, this, we have uh, both Scotts Bluff and Gearing will be implementing the program. We'll have it in North Platte. Um, we'll have it in Hastings, Grand Island and Wayne and Columbus. And so across the state. Um, so how do you, the medical community, participate in such a program? I would encourage you to think about the horizontal approach rather than the vertical approach. 
if we didn't have a pediatrician who was really interested in us forming a team that we could work together and bring in other people within the community, I don't think we would have been as successful. So being part of a community team, also being very involved in the recruitment. Um, the way we've always reached families was through our physicians and clinics. And so whether it's pediatricians or our family practitioners, they refer families to our program. We also have flyers in each exam room um, across Kearney and all of our clinics and with all of our pediatricians. We also recruit through schools and community resources, but the medical community is huge and having advocate, advocates within the medical community has been great. Just to show you briefly what our um, program looks like um, with the funding from CDC, we have created a new branding. Uh, so this is what our branding looks like for building healthy families. And we've created this online training program and resources. And so um, the communities that have applied to be part of the program, and I should say we used a horizontal approach with the communities as well. Instead of going into a community and telling them to implement the program, we actually provided an opportunity for them to apply. We put out an RFP and communities had to form a team, multidisciplinary and multi-organizational uh, team and apply for being part of the program. We're providing some funding, but more importantly, we're providing access to the site. And so the communities that are part of the program will receive access to the site. They'll also receive training as to how to implement the program. Session guides, each weekly session, we have curriculum, we have lesson plans, we have videos of how to implement the programs, all of the handouts that you would need. Uh, we have recruitment flyers, examples of how to recruit, physician letters. Uh, we have a data portal, so all the data can go in and the um, community is able to see on a weekly basis how their families are doing. Are they losing weight? Are they self-monitoring? Where are their activity levels? So everything is built into this one site. Um, the training, we provide training to all the facilitators. We have an overall training so everybody can learn about the program. And then based on your role within the program, you'll have individual specific training. Uh, so like the lifestyle modification coordinator would have additional training on her role or his role within the program. And then once you get into the session guides each week, we have, um, again, videos, um, handouts, lesson plans for the physical activity. We have games, videos of how to do the games, all of the equipment that you would need. And so we've tried to provide everything that a community would need to easily be able to implement such a program. So with that, I will take any questions. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. It's really impressive the um, uh, considering the uphill battle that most um, people consider weight loss to be in the pediatric population, the success of your program. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll start with one. Um, I'm wondering as a pediatrician, as a mom, um, and you know, as I think a, a general group of healthcare providers, we're always <clears throat> worried about the health of our children during something like this pandemic. And the reports, early reports at least, are of excessive weight gain and increasing obesity and overweight status in our um, young patients. Would you approach uh, children who have not had long-term uh, concerns with weight in a different way? Any thoughts for uh, upcoming research uh, with regards to changes in the pandemic? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm sure you're aware there's been data that's been released with adults. I believe it was 26 pounds um, was the average weight gain. Um, and don't quote me on that because I can't remember for sure, but we um, immediately started looking to see if there's any data on children. And because kids have not been in schools, there's not large databases on that. Um, we were able to get into our schools here to see if there's been any, but we've been in school. And so be, besides the first six months, um, it's really not a good population to look at. Um, to get back to your question, um, I think if you're working with a child who didn't previously have a weight problem, but has gained weight over this pandemic, it wouldn't be something that I would heavily focus on. 
but I would look to see how the schools are reopening with the environment. Are we getting out to recess? Are we making sure, because we do know that there's gonna be some academic loss and times where we have academic loss, we tend to cut out things such as physical education and recess. And we need to make sure kids are active multiple times throughout the day. What's the full school food environment looking like as far as outside foods being brought in? One thing we found is kids are being fed for everything that they do well. We don't need that. Uh, we replaced in the schools um, food rewards with more activity rewards. And so I'd really focus too as pediatricians with the families on looking at the whole environment. What kind of foods have you been bringing into the house with the pandemic? And can we go back to eating healthier if that's been changed? I would also suggest uh, talking to families about how the family dynamics have either increased or decreased with activity and trying to get kids back involved with activity. So a long question or a long answer to your question, I apologize. That is um, a fantastic answer. I appreciate it. Uh, Dr. Nasser has a comment and a question. Uh, she says, our poster presented in the symposium shows a four percentile point increase in BMI over the COVID year. We also found significant disparities. Any information about the diversity mix of your population, uptake of the program and success rates? I think she means across diverse populations. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's too, too bad. Four percentile points is so much. Um, so the data I shared is from Kearney, Nebraska, and so we're primarily Caucasian. Um, we only have, I think it's 6% uh, diversity within our population. We are um, very excited about the seven communities that are implementing our program because there's a lot more diversity within those communities. And the next grant, I believe, um, and so those of you know who Dr. Esther Brooks and Hill, you can put a little pin into them. But um, I think where we're gonna go next is really trying to change some of the nutrition education. We need to A, um, look at language barriers, but B, we know that there's cultural differences, especially um, in rural communities in Nebraska, we have a lot of um, Hispanic population that they cook differently. And so we need to change our nutrition education for those communities. And um, we need to look into some more cultural cooking techniques and changes within that. So I don't have data, but we are very aware of um, the population that we have so far and looking to expand that and to diversify. Fantastic. I think there are uh, quite a few people on this call that would be excited about collaborating with you on future projects. Uh, we have one more question before we move on to Dr. Scar's presentation. Uh, this is from Matt Kling. He says, I may have missed it, but have you considered the effects of social media, video games, and electronics? And do you have any suggestions or a plan to address those issues? Great question. Um, so part of our physical activity um, messages are also decreasing screen time. It's just a part of the initiatives. We wanna increase activity and then there's also avenues of trying to get kids to decrease screen time. And so stop focusing on activity, decrease screen time, and then you get the activity. Um, it's become horrible with the social media and video games. It's, um, I see it in my own home. These kids are on you know, their phones all the time. I remember my college students getting a phone when they were 18. Now everybody's getting one when they turn 10. Um, and so it's a continual issue. There's more and more activity-based apps, which we're starting to look at and starting to promote. And there's more and more grants that are aimed that direction to try to get kids, if you're gonna be on your phone all the time, let's try to get more activity out of them. But it's definitely a, an issue. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a fascinating presentation and we look forward to hearing more uh, about your work in the upcoming years. Great, thank you. Um, all right, well, next we will transition into our next speaker, Dr. Gwen Scar. And uh, she just put into the chat some instructions and I think you'll see that up here on the screen as well. So if you can uh, listen and get started on um, your digital device, uh, 
think we're all used to that. Uh, so Dr. Scar is an assistant professor in the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases here at the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Dr. Scar is, um, has an active basic science laboratory studying the role of complement on the immune responses and neurologic outcomes following infections in the brain so that uh, we might design improved prevention and treatment strategies for these infections. In addition to her basic science research, Dr. Scar has been involved in clinical studies of the central nervous system infection and authored numerous book chapters on the subject. She has received several peer reviewed grants to support her research and won several local and national research awards. Dr. Scar was one of CHRI's first CHRI scholars and successfully completed the program when awarded with her KO8. Dr. Scar's presentation is Developing Your Path in Research. Thank you so much for joining us today. You bet. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to Dr. Anderson Berry um, and the rest of the organizers of the forum. I appreciate the invitation. I am hoping for a tiny bit of audience participation today. Um, so the instructions are here on the screen. You can use any device. Um, if you go to that website, they'll ask you for the code. You only have to answer one question and I promise it's an easy question to answer. Um, so as Dr. Anderson Berry said, I have a basic science laboratory. So I am a pediatric infectious disease physician here. Um, and through my experiences in training, got very interested in shunt infections and have um, sort of developed a research career around those. Um, rather than talking about the exciting work that we're doing in the lab and showing you um, some data, I thought I would really rather talk about developing your path in research. Um, I think from the outside, research can oftentimes seem very intimidating, um, and it's a little hard um, to maybe overcome some of the barriers to getting involved. But today my goal is to convince you that we need pediatric research. And if you are interested in doing research, you absolutely can. Um, my only disclosures are my research funding. So I do have funding from the NIH and then receive some um, funding from CHRI. So our objectives today are to recognize the need for pediatric research, understand how to get started, and then appreciate the qualities of a successful researcher. So pediatric specific research is greatly needed. Um, our patients deserve evidence-based care um, and evidence of the safety and efficacy of those treatments. I don't know if you've ever looked at um, some of the practice guidelines from different societies or organizations, um, but sometimes if you look at um, the quality of the evidence for their recommendations or what that was based on, you'll see that a lot of times there isn't much data to drive those recommendations. And it's really just a consensus um, of some experts or people that have experience in the field. And pediatric patients are a bit of a unique population. So they're a very heterogeneous group that ranges from um, you know, extreme preemies all the way to post-pubertal adolescents and college students. And within that group, there are a lot of complex physiologic, developmental, psychologic, and pharmacologic characteristics. And on top of that, uh, pediatric patients are affected by diseases and conditions that do not occur in adults. So we really need pediatric specific research and not to just rely on um, adult research. As clinicians, we have a really unique perspective for finding the knowledge gaps as we're taking care of patients and then developing research questions that can directly impact clinical care. Um, and I think that is one of the things that most drew me to research. And as we kind of talk about my path in research, um, that became a very important factor for me. Sadly, children are severely underrepresented in the world of clinical research. So kids make up 27% of the world's population. Um, but when you look at clinical trials that are registered with the World Health Organization, only 16.7% of those trials were pediatric. So there's certainly a gap there. 
prior to instituting an incentive program, um, only about 20% of medications that were FDA approved included label information for pediatric use. Um, despite this, we still have 50% or more of all drugs that lack um, labeling information with pediatric specific um, dosing, safety, efficacy, all of those things. And when you look at um, clinical trials in total, you can see here that there was a very large increase um, in clinical trials from the late 40s to sort of the early 2000s. But pediatric clinical trials certainly didn't follow the same trend. We're still sitting with um, a very minor portion of pediatric clinical trials that are being conducted. Um, and unfortunately, within that limited amount of pediatric research that is occurring, um, we have major gaps. And there are certain groups of children that are particularly underrepresented in the clinical trials that do occur. Um, and that would be our um, patients that live in rural areas, lower socioeconomic status, those um, of racial and ethnic minorities, and then those that live in low and middle income countries. And I think um, this is sort of a great tie-in to Dr. Keelan's presentation where she was looking at uh, rural communities. And then we really talked about that, um, you know, minorities were underrepresented in that research and we know that, um, and it's something that they're working to improve. I wanna shift gears here a minute. Um, and this is where the audience participation comes into play. Um, so now we know that we need pediatric research, but I wanna take a moment to shift um, and talk about scientists. So the question that I'd like you to participate in is who is the first scientist um, that comes to mind? Um, we have some responses here. It seems like Einstein, Marie Curie um, are very well represented. Um, I see some other answers that are coming in. Dr. Fauci has certainly been in the news here lately. Um, and what's interesting, so the size of the text obviously corresponds to um, how often that response was given. Um, so we're gonna go back to my uh, presentation here. And you can see, um, I thought of many of the same people. So Einstein, Rosalind Franklin, Marie Curie, um, Kizzy Corbett, um, Jonas Salk, Dr. Simonson, um, and then Kiyoshi Shiga here. Um, so when we think of scientists, right, there are certainly certain people that come to mind. And when you think of someone like um, an Albert Einstein, you might sort of think that he was just born this amazing scientist and emerged um, and that uh, he didn't really have to work for anything. I would argue that researchers are made and they're not born. Um, so certainly for those of us that have um, clinical training, our training taught us the necessary tools to be clinicians. Um, you know, none of us innately know how to be researchers. So we also have to learn um, the tools that we need for research. And with the many, many, many different types of research. So we just heard about implementation and dissemination. I'm a basic science researcher, clinical science. Um, and within that there's industry sponsored trials, investigator initiated, there's education research, there's quality improvement research. And while some skills do sort of transcend what type of research you're doing, there are certainly different um, skills required for different types of research. So I like to think about research as a continuum and I'm using basic and bench science because that's um, sort of the world that I live in. And typically when you're going to a research forum and you're, um, or a conference and you're hearing a keynote speaker or someone speak, they're usually somebody who lives on this side of the spectrum. So, um, you know, they've been in research a while, they've had some success, they found some interesting findings. Um, there's a good chance that they have several people in their lab that are working for them or with them and producing data. And what you're seeing that they're presenting is many years of research. And again, I love that Dr. Hewlin um, showed us her timeline of we started small um, and from those findings we grew and we grew and now we have this program. And I think that um, 
is not something that you always see, right? So we all have to start somewhere. Um, and we kind of start on this left end of the spectrum where we know nothing um, and we learn some skills and then we learn some more skills and eventually um, we hope that we become successful researchers. Really that path is not straight. Um, it's very twisty, it's windy, there are setbacks. Um, so don't think that it is a smooth and easy process. I wanted to talk a little bit about where I started, especially for the trainees in the audience. I was where you were. So I have done all of my undergraduate um, education as well as medical education, residency and fellowship here within the University of Nebraska system. I didn't attend any um, institutions that are traditionally thought of as research powerhouses. Um, and I certainly wasn't born with any innate ability to do research. Um, I had to put in the time and learn how to do all of these things. Where my research career started was as an undergraduate at UNL. Um, I needed a summer job. Um, and I found a job working as a technician in a microbiology lab on East Campus. Um, we actually worked with Mycobacterium avium complex as it pertained to uh, Yanni's disease in cows. Uh, when I started, I was the low person on the totem pole. I was the person that was autoclaving the dirty dishes. Um, you know, making media, all of the not very fun or glamorous jobs in research. Um, but certainly my time there, I was able to, you know, learn more skills, um, doing PCR, doing bacterial culture, all of those things. Um, you know, it was an interesting job. It got the job done. It made me some money um, and things like that. When I went to medical school, I honestly thought I was leaving research behind. Um, it wasn't something that I really saw myself doing in the future. Um, but then after first year, uh, I decided to enroll in the um, College of Medicine summer undergraduate research or summer medical student research program. I had talked with one of the professors in the Department of Genetics and they had a little project that I could work on. So I spent that summer um, staring into a microscope and looking for red and green dots on slides of cells. I am still looking into a microscope, staring at red and green dots in different types of cells now, um, but certainly learned some skills there that were helpful. Again, really didn't see myself having a career in research, but that began to change in residency. So after I, or during my rotation with the infectious disease division in pediatrics, somehow it came up that I had done some research and I liked pipetting and everyone said, oh, you got to meet Dr. Snowden. She's amazing. She has a lab. You should absolutely get into the lab and work on some things with her. Really didn't know a whole lot about um, what her lab was all about, but said, yeah, I like pipetting. I miss it a little bit. Let's do that. Um, so I started working, or I did a one month rotation in Dr. Snowden's lab. Um, she is the originator of the mouse model of shunt infection that I continue to work with. And I can't say that it was like the best research experience, but what was the best experience um, was Dr. Snowden herself. Um, so if you've ever met her, she's incredibly passionate about research, very approachable. She's excited about science. She's excited about teaching others about science and doing um, good work for kids. And that was something that really resonated with me. So when it came to do my fellowship in pediatric infectious disease, um, I decided to stay here at UNMC and continue to work in Dr. Snowden's lab. So most of her projects were related around um, shunt infection and her mouse model and looking at a lot of host pathogen interactions. Again, I can't say that I was super passionate about that project, but it was interesting. I was learning skills. But where I sort of started to develop a real interest um, in shunt infection, as well as basic science research, was actually on the clinical side of my life. So for whatever reason, in the first year and a half of my pediatric infectious disease fellowship, there were a higher number than normal of CSF shunt infections. 
and going to look at the literature to learn how to manage these and decide how to best take care of patients, I realized how many knowledge gaps there were um, surrounding the diagnosis and treatment of shunt infections. So that really sort of fed a passion in me and I became much more interested in the work that was going on in the lab and then really developed my own personal interest in improving the diagnosis of shunt infections which uh, my mentors uh, were very supportive of me designing my own little uh, clinical study where we used CSF um, patients from patients that was in storage. And we looked at some inflammatory markers in that CSF and that led to a first publication. From there, I grew my research program and said, well, we found some interesting findings in humans. That's really great. Unfortunately, there are a lot of complications with doing shut infection uh, research in actual patients. One of them is sort of availability. We definitely don't want patients getting infections and it's rare. So finding samples was um, going to be a challenge. So to overcome that hurdle, what I did was adapted the mouse model that Dr. Snowden had created to rats so that we could sample their CSF. Um, again, we found some interesting things and this led to a publication. We found some things that we maybe weren't expecting though. So here's my one slide of data that we're gonna look at and what it says is actually not that important for you guys. But what we found was there were a lot of complement components that were present in the CSF. And remember that complement is part of the innate immune system and it is involved in sort of opsonizing and tagging bacteria and other pathogens for removal by our immune system. So I have this data um, and we sort of said, well, this doesn't make sense. We know that at day five, we don't have a lot of bacteria left. So why are there so much complement um, present in the CSF? And so at the time, um, Dr. Tammy Killian had sort of taken over as being my primary mentor and she was very astute and said, there's a lot of things going on uh, with complements in sort of the neuroscience literature and neuroinflammation. I think you should really look into this further. And really this forms the basis for my K award now. So to date, my career has sort of been a journey from microbiology to pediatrics, to immunology, to having to learn neuroscience um, to sort of further our research aims. And it's definitely not linear. It's sort of the swirly vortex um, of these experiences and findings that have really made um, me poised to tackle the questions of shut infections and really be a, sort of a unique researcher. So we are really the only lab um, in the world looking at what we're looking at right now. So the main um, aim of our lab is really looking at exploring the role of complement and in shunt infections. So our hypothesis right now is that complement mediated synaptic pruning is responsible for the neurologic consequences associated with shunt infection. And we have um, various experiments looking at behavior, um, complements in the brain, uh, quantitating synaptic puncta and all of those things uh, surrounding answering this question. We also have another avenue of investigation. I'm still continue to be interested in identifying diagnostic biomarkers in the CSF um, and perhaps using those to track treatment so that we can better define antibiotic treatment courses in these patients. So that really involves a lot of rat studies at this time and we're planning some studies and getting together uh, grants and research protocols so that we can have a small human pilot study, hopefully between two sites. Well, that's great, Dr. Scar, but I have no interest in doing basic science work or in doing what you do. So if you're thinking about research, I think there are many ways to think about it. Um, but when you're first getting started, there are some places that you could ask yourself if they would be good for you to start at. So is there a type of research that interests you? Is there a subject area that you're particularly in 
interested in? Have you met a faculty member or heard them speak somewhere and you're really interested in working with them because you felt like they inspired you or you were just interested in their work? Or more specifically, do you have a knowledge gap that you've identified or a clinical question that you would like to address? Um, certainly know that an initial project or start in research doesn't have to perfectly fit your interests or be something that you're incredibly passionate about. Um, research opportunities can teach you technical skills, methods, processes, and help define what interests you. So back to that um, experience in Jessica's lab as a resident, when I uh, found out what she did, I sort of said, you want me to do what with my snout? No, no, that's not for me, no thank you. But certainly what did catch me was her enthusiasm for what she did in science and making uh, pediatric researchers. And I knew that that was somebody that I wanted to continue to work with. Certainly when you're thinking about projects, lead time is really important. Um, depending on what type of research you're gonna be doing, there's a lot of times necessary training, whether that's city, comparative medicine, um, and many others. And then there's a lot of regulatory paperwork that also has to be completed so that you're able to work on projects. And then I think it's really important to design a project that works within your time frame. There's certainly something that's a lot more rewarding in terms of seeing the bigger picture when you can design the project um, or see the full scope of it. Certainly when I started out in research, I was just doing some things and I didn't really see the whole big picture, but putting um, it all together sort of made me have some aha moments of, oh, I see how that all fits together. And I think it's also important to have realistic expectations. So again, depending on the type of research that you're gonna be doing, it can take a lot of time to learn the skills that you need for that, um, especially if you're talking about something like a basic science laboratory. You know, if you've never held a pipette before or done some of the things, it's gonna take a bit of time and some training to figure out how to do that. And then I would say not all, projects result in publications and posters. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, um, where in my life we've done some experience, experiments where um, you know, they haven't really showed us anything. And then certainly studies can take a long time to complete. Um, again, Dr. Hewlin's presentation was a great example of um, you know, some of those early projects took many years to find data from. So practical advice. I think one of the greatest resources for you out there if you're interested in research is the Child Health Research Institute and the website. Um, certainly there are a lot of great things on there. We talked a little bit about, you know, is there a topic you're interested in or is there a specific faculty member? Well, you're able to search um, through the website and look at the different types of projects people are involved in and then who are doing who is doing those projects and they certainly have lots of other resources to sort of help um, grow you as a researcher there is a biannual academic workshop the one coming up in august is going to be heavily focused on sort of skills and things necessary for research there are also some other modules from the pediatric research office that talk about, again, some of the necessary components for research. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. This is sort of an abbreviated list. Again, I'd refer you to the Cherry website to look at all of the investigators in CHRI. Um, but if you're interested in clinical research, we are part of a larger um, pediatric research network. And some of the people associated with that are Drs. McCullough, Neiman, Deschamps, Simonson, and then research coordinator, Rochelle Wellman. If you're interested in quality improvement research, Drs. Maloney and Norton have identified themselves as being interested and willing to work with people on projects. Educational research, I would um, point you towards the Academy of Educators at UNMC, and Dr. Nabauer tells me that they are currently accepting applications within the Academy, and she or Dr. Golahan would be happy to talk with you. 
Um, some of the folks involved in basic science research are myself, Dr. Spolter, Mahapatra, Peoples, and Solomon. So we've gotten you excited about research. Um, you know it's needed, you know that you can do it. And I think this is one of the most difficult factors is really staying involved. Um, and as an investigator, it takes a lot of persistence and resilience. So frequently your hypothesis is incorrect. Um, many times experiments don't work where they need fine tuning and optimizing. In the clinical realm, recruitment can be a large challenge. Um, and then one of the things that's really not fun about research is there's a lot of inherent rejection. So when you're submitting grants, when you're submitting papers, they very often don't get accepted and they get returned for additional work. And that can be really hard. Um, so there are a lot of highs and lows within research. And I think that's, um, can be hard, especially as a clinician, when I know that um, I'm doing research because I like it um, and not because I have to. I think one of the other skills that's really essential as a researcher is being flexible and following the data. Can't say it too many times, but your hypothesis is frequently incorrect. Um, but one of the great things is that unexpected results can open new avenues of investigation. So I never would have expected that we would have seen elevated complement in CSF sort of after infection, but it really up opened a whole new world of investigation in an area that is pretty exciting and could mean great things for patients. I think what you have to realize is that everyone's path is different. So we're all starting at a different place. Um, and then we're all at different places in that path. Two or three weeks ago, when I was starting to put this talk together, I'll be honest, I was incredibly frustrated and annoyed that experiments in the lab were not working as I wanted them to. Um, and again, that's really difficult when you know that um, you don't have to do research, right? So if there's ever a day that I get too frustrated or too annoyed, I don't have to do this anymore. I can um, transition and do more clinical care. And not that clinical care is in any way easier because it's absolutely not, but with 10 years of education devoted to becoming a clinician, uh, oftentimes that feels like the more comfortable space. Um, and so it can seem attractive when you are having um, difficulties in the research realm. But one of, when I'm in that space, I think the thing that I have to do is remind myself that the ultimate goal is to improve care for kids and take better care of our patients. And that's really essential. I wanna take a moment to um, thank some people. So I have to give a big thank you to Matt Beaver. He's the technician in my laboratory and he's over here um, in the photo. He is really the one that is um, sort of the hands in the labs. He is doing all the pipetting, making sure the experiments are getting done, um, making sure that things in the lab are running smoothly. And I could absolutely not do any of this without him. Um, thank you to my mentors. So my current primary mentor, Dr. Killian, and many members of her lab that have um, helped teach me things, whether that's technique or analysis. Um, and then uh, co-mentor, uh, Dr. Donayevsky and uh, Laura in her lab, as well as Dr. Snowden and members of her lab, certainly our collaborators at UNO. Big shout out to the Pediatric Infectious Disease Division, especially our support and clinical staff. They are great um, gatekeepers for me and I appreciate that greatly. And certainly the Child Health Research Institute um, and many of the resources and support that you can find there. And I would be happy to take any um, questions or comments at this time. Thank you so much, Dr. Scar, for that story of passion, inquisition, persistence, and uh, resilience. It's uh, really an inspiring story, and, think, and I think our trainees in particular will um, remember this for quite a while. Uh, we have a couple of comments and questions. Uh, Dr. Solomon says, great resources at CHRI. 
Uh, they can definitely work to assist with getting you connected and the workshops are great. And so if any of you want to check out those resources, if you haven't already, I would encourage that. And then Dr. Kling says, great talk, Gwen. In regards to medical students gaining basic science research experience, how much emphasis do you think should be placed on the clinically translatable aspects of their research project? I think there are lots of views on that. Um, personally, I, I wouldn't still be involved in research if I didn't see the clinical application. And that's sort of really what drew me back to research. I think there are times where if you're starting out and doing projects and you're viewing it as learning some skills and methodology, it's not essential that you sort of see uh, a large emphasis on clinically translatable aspects. I certainly have many, many basic scientist colleagues, um, and they're doing great work, things looking at bacterial pathogenesis, um, metal metabolism within microbes, with the ultimate goal of impacting clinical care with things like Staph aureus and MRSA. Um, so that clinical translatability is sort of a large spectrum. Um, and I think you kind of have to find the right place on that spectrum for you. Um, you know, working on bacterial metabolism might really speak to somebody, um, but working on a project that is more clinically translatable might speak to someone else differently. Great. And one last question. Science comes inherently with lots of rejection. Um, Oh, and another question just came in. So this will be two questions. Okay. Uh, so what are your personal um, hints for overcoming that rejection, whether it's rejection of your hypothesis by your own science, rejection of abstracts or papers, or, uh, you know, reviewer to always get you on grant proposals. Uh, do you have hints for um, how you uh, can be resilient um, and still come back with a passion day after day? Um, it's hard, I will say that. Um, I think initially you just sort of have to feel those feelings um, when you get your grant review slip back and you read the comments. You're going to have a lot of feelings about those and that's okay. Um, and then I have to kind of put it aside for a minute um, and you're still not feeling really great about that. Um, but I think that's when you can sort of um, draw life enthusiasm from your personal life, your hobbies, clinical care, a great interaction with a patient. Um, and then one thing that I find really helpful is talking with uh, my other physician scientist colleagues and friends, sort of talking with people that have had the same experiences and the same feelings and um, venting about it a little bit can get you back in a happy place. That's certainly what happened with me uh, three weeks ago when I was feeling down about research. Dr. Snowden and I had a great Zoom where we talked about science and clinical things and uh, just fun things and it really got me back on track. Fantastic, relationship-based as is everything in life, right? Mm-hmm. All right, and then Dr. Sparks um, has a comment question. Very nice talk. Uh, you've described a very nonlinear course in acquiring the skills and experiences to do your research. You now describe yourself as a basic scientist. How and when on this life course did you find yourself passionate about research? I think it was really those experiences in fellowship when I was working in Jessica's lab and sort of expanding my technical skill set and then saw on the clinical side how much we didn't know and could see that, well, answering some of these questions in the lab is very doable. And so that all came together. I would say at that time, I still thought of myself as more of a uh, translational scientist, I guess, because what I'm working on, I feel like has direct clinical implications and I still see myself um, in some ways as that type of scientist, but certainly we are working on a lot of more basic science things in the labs and more mechanistic approaches. Thank you so much for your time this evening and sharing this amazing story of growth and development of a scientist in medicine. Uh, we really appreciate your time. 
And uh, for those of you that have just joined us, please look at the chat for the CME uh, information. And we are using both the chat and the Q&A for questions. We'll now um, transition into a really exciting part of our evening. And this is the Pediatric Research Forum Trainee Awards. I'm so thrilled that we're able to offer these, uh, these trainee awards again. This is our second year of doing this. And it's a great way to recognize the work that's produced in Omaha in child health research. This year, we featured four award categories and a panel of judges from CHRI's Pediatric Research Office and senior CHRI investigators reviewed the submitted abstracts and posters and scored them based on the background of the abstract, significance of the problem, their hypotheses, problem or question posed, experimental design, results and data, and the conclusion. It's my pleasure to announce the top winners in each category. Award winners will receive a gift card and plaque and after all of the awards are announced, we'll have the first place award winners from each category briefly present, followed by an opportunity for each presenter to answer one question posed by our audience. If you have a question for a presenter, please submit it using the Zoom Q&A feature or the chat. So without further ado, let's announce the winners for our trainee awards. First, we have our resident fellow awards. Our first place winner in this category is Dr. Amanda Dave. Congratulations, Dr. Dave. Second place has been awarded to Dr. Naveen Kumar Permel. Well done. And the third place goes to Anup Panthea. Good job, Dr. Panthea. Next up is the graduate, both master's and doctoral level, level awards. In first place, we have Dr. Anam Akbar. Congratulations. The second place award winner is Dr. Morgan Busboom. Great job. The third place winner is Gabrielle Brumfield. Wonderful work, Gabrielle. Now on to our medical student award. Our first place winner is Jeffrey Keppel. Way to go, Jeffrey. In second place, we have Adriana Della Pola. Congratulations, Adriano. And in third place, we have Megan Gillespie. Awesome work, Megan. Please note, you can see all of these posters and hear verbal presentations in our uh, poster award session. The login instructions have been emailed to you. All right, moving on to our undergraduate award. In first place, we have Diego Gomez. Wonderful work, Diego. And a final thank you to all of you who submitted your work to be considered for an award. We had very difficult decisions this year in um, choosing these top submissions as there were so many extraordinary projects covering a wide array of topics from varying disciplines. I do think that this shows the resilience of our child health research community to be able to put forward such wonderful work, all while dealing with a pandemic and the clinical implications of that. Now we have an exciting opportunity to allow the first place winners to present their work. At this time, I'll ask Dr. Amanda Dave to introduce herself, share her screen with the group and present her research. Hi, I'm gonna turn my screen on. Okay. Okay, um, can everybody see my screen? Looks good. Awesome, okay. Uh, hi, I'm Amanda Dave. I am a third year pediatrics resident at UNMC. Uh, Children's in Creighton in our joint program. My project is evaluation of brain cholesterol metabolism after neonatal hypoxic ischemic brain injury. Um, I perform these experiments with the help of Dr. People's lab and Dr. Corey's lab in, the, in August 2020. Uh, this is a CHRI funded project and we received a CHRI grant in December of 2019. Uh, so some overall introduction, uh, hypoxic ischemic brain injury, um, which you can kind of understand from the term itself, results from impaired cerebral blood flow and oxygen delivery to the brain. And with the clinical implications that it affects a significant a number of term babies each year in the United States. Uh, for cholesterol, cholesterol is important for growth and development in the fetal and neonatal brain. Uh, synthesis of cholesterol in the brain is almost entirely de novo and is highly sensitive to alterations in brain homeostasis. With respect to analogous disease states that have implications in uh, the adult brain, so altered levels of cholesterol and metabolites have been identified in tissues 
after a disease state such as uh, traumatic brain injury, stroke, multiple sclerosis, um, and then in areas with in animals with cholesterol deficiency, there have been noted er in larger areas of infarct in a stroke model. With respect to neonatal encephalopathy and hypoxic ischemic brain injury, uh, there have been previous studies that have shown some implications of altered cholesterol levels, but in no literature and preclinical or clinical data has there been evaluation of cholesterol precursors um, from a regional or temporal standpoint. So the objective of our study was to take a look at both temporal and regional specific differences in brain cholesterol and cholesterol precursor levels or metabolites after injury in a mouse model of neonatal hypoxic ischemic brain injury. If we go to figure one, before I get into our methods, you'll see that this is kind of the current understanding of the central nervous system cholesterol metabolism. Um, the neurons and astroglia predominantly use the block pathway and you can, I'm not going to have everybody go back to their biochemistry days. However, you can see that some of the key metabolites and precursors to cholesterol include lanosterol, desmosterol, 7-dehydroxycholesterol or 7-DHC, which I'll refer to as throughout the rest of the presentation. And then desmosterol through DHCR24 enzyme is metabolized to cholesterol. And 7-DHC is metabolized to cholesterol uh, in the candace russell pathway via DHCR7. Um, there have been some preliminary ideas regarding the implications of hypoxic ischemic injury and how that affects the brain metabolism. Um, and our study, if we go into the methods, is a basic science project. So we looked at postnatal uh, pups and they were randomized to either hypoxic ischemic brain injury or control or sham surgery. The uh, experimental group had right carotid artery ligation versus the sham surgery where the right carotid artery was identified but was not ligated. Uh, and the hypoxic uh, group had eight, 30 minutes at 8% oxygen, which gives you that hypoxic component versus the control group, which was 30 minutes at 21%. Um, anesthesia and analgesia were performed and, and the mice were kept normothermic throughout these experiments. After uh, surgery and recover from surgery and then that uh, area, period of hypoxia or control, uh, animals were sacrificed at different time points and then brain tissue as well as plasma was collected. Uh, the time points that we use based off of review of the literature were 30 minutes after injury, 24 minutes, 24 hours after injury, and 72 hours after injury. With respect to the regions that we dissected, we looked at the cortex, cerebellum, striatum, thalamus, and hippocampus. We did pr protein quantitation with BACA assays, and then we identified sterols by mass spectroscopy. So those sterols that I um, discussed previously in figure one, including cholesterol, desmosterol, 7-dehydroxycholesterol, and osterol were the main metabolites that we looked at. And then with uh, respect to level of severity of hypoxic ischemic brain injury, we use IL-6 uh, measured by ELISA as a marker for that. With respect to our results, um, we did, like I said previously, we did temporal and regional uh, differences. So we looked at both time points as well as different parts of the brain. With respect to all hypoxic ischemic brain injury, we did not find any statistically significant differences in measures between control group and experimental group. However, uh, as we go to figure two, when you look at severe hypoxic ischemic brain injury, as it defined by IL-6 values, which are indicators of, uh, we used a, as a severity indicator of injury. Uh, desmosterol 70HC and desmosterol were higher in the cortex at 24 hours after hypoxic ischemic brain injury. And then desmosterol was lower in the striatum, but higher in the cerebellum at 24 hours after injury. You can see here where our, um, this is cholesterol, for example. And then this, you can see that at the 24 hours time point that it was uh, statistically significant. Now, what are the implications of this research and what are the clinical implications of that? So we were able to conclude that severe neonatal hypoxic ischemic brain injury is associated with increased cholesterol and sterile precursors in the cortex. Um, and then further defining the mechanisms of these alterations can provide opportunities for development of diagnostic biomarkers and targeted therapies. Uh, this 
the implications, including that a uh, significant number of babies affected each year with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And if we're able to better identify uh, alterations in cholesterol metabolism that could have implications clinically, uh, potentially finding biomarkers can make it easier to identify these infants earlier, as well as find ways to treat them appropriately and better improve their outcomes. Um, as I said before, we were a, a CHRI pediatric research grant recipient, so we'd like to acknowledge them and thank them for their time. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm just going to wait a couple of seconds to see if anyone else has a question that they're texting in, and if not, I will um, happily ask one. All right, well, I'm not seeing anyone uh, texting in. So uh, you're describing a uh, model that is uh, two, two types of insult, a hypoxic insult and an ischemic insult. Uh, is it going to be important in future work to uh, discern which type of injuries or which particular insult is impacting uh, brain cholesterol metabolism? And if so, how would you approach that? I think from a methodology standpoint, you could potentially isolate those two variables and have uh, mice that were just exposed to that hypoxic event, right? So just being exposed to the 8% oxygen uh, versus the ischemic event, which would involve the carotid artery ligation. Uh, our experiments as they're progressing right now is more to better understand whether this is an intracellular versus extracellular process, as well as delineation of whether it's neuron driven, astrocyte driven, or microglia driven. But I agree that's a very interesting premise and could be something that could be future experiments in the future. Thank you so much for an excellent presentation. We're really excited about your work and hope you continue that moving forward. Um, looking forward to continuing experiments with Dr. Peoples and Dr. Corrid. Excellent. All right, well, we'll have you stop sharing your poster. And it's my pleasure next to ask uh, Dr. Anam Akbar uh, to share her screen and present her research. Thank you. Thank you. Let me share my screen. Can everyone see my poster? Looks great. Good evening, everyone. My name is Anam Akbar. I'm a second year PhD student here in UNMC. So my project is genetic and pharmacological inhibition of signal transducer and activated transcription factor STAT3 in medulloblastoma. It sensitized the medulloblastoma cells and tumor growth to conventional chemotherapy, that is cisplatin. So medulloblastoma is a primary malignant brain tumor. Every year there are 300 new cases are registered for medulloblastoma. There are treatment options available for medulloblastoma, but uh, as we know that the side effect of treatment options uh, are very bad. It decreases the quality of the life of the patient. So our aim is to uh, introduce a, a small molecular inhibitor in the treatment. It will help in decrease the um, dose of uh, conventional chemotherapy and would help in increase the quality of life of surviving patient. For that, we chose a STAT3 uh, molecule. STAT3 is a latent uh, cytoplasmic transcription factor. And in cells, STAT3 are is tightly regulated by negative inhibitors. However, in, in uh, different tumor, STAT3 is constitutively activated. Previously, our lab have seen uh, with IHC that in medulloblastoma tumor, the STAT3 is constitutively activated and it affects the target genes. And these target genes are involved in different aspects of cancer, including migration, uh, abnormal cell differentiation, and abnormal cell proliferation. So uh, in order to prove our hypothesis, first uh, we generated the dox inducible STAT3 stable cell line. Uh, we treated the medulloblastoma cell line SH STAT3 and uh, ONSS STAT3 and SD STAT3 with doxycycline. After treating with doxycycline, we saw that there is significant decrease in STAT3 expression, both in protein expression and gene expression. Next, we wanted to see whether the dox will have effect on uh, medulloblastoma cell survivor. And we saw that uh, the treatment of doxycycline in medulloblastoma cells, the medulloblastoma cells viability decreased significantly. Uh, our next aim was to see that uh, 
the small molecular inhibitor uh, would have any effect on STAT3 and medulloblastoma uh, cell survivability. Uh, for small molecular inhibitor, we actually choose WP106. WP106 is under clinical uh, phase one clinical trial of uh, various tumor, including melanoma and other uh, pediatric tumor. We chose the WP106 molecule and we treat the medulloblastoma cells to see the protein and uh, uh, genes expression of STAT3. We saw that with protein and gene expression of STAT3, uh, with treatment of w WP106, uh, protein and gene expression went down significantly. Not only that, we actually saw that medulloblastoma cell survivability also decreased with increased dose, dose of WP106. For our in vivo study, we, we used both models. We used, uh, first we injected the nude mice with doxycycline uh, inducible uh, cell line, and then we used the parental cell line of HDMP03. When we treat the mice with, dox, uh, with doxycycline, we saw there was a increased survival of tumor in uh, increased survival of tumor, as well as increased sensitivity to cisplatin with uh, doxycycline uh, treatment. Similarly, in case of, uh, our uh, WPO treatment, we saw that WPO treatment along with cisplatin increased the tumor uh, survival, uh, increased the mice survival and decreased the tumor volume significantly compared to single agent treatment alone. So what we concluded, we concluded that uh, indeed STAT3 inhibition, ha STAT3 has significant role in medulloblastoma pathogenesis and STAT3 inhibition decreased medulloblastoma survivability. It also in uh, sensitized the medulloblastoma cell and medulloblastoma tumor for conventional chemotherapy cisplatin. It will help in reduction of uh, dose of chemotherapy and it can improve the quality of life of surviving patients. Our future direction, we want to see the similar effect on orthotoping implantations if there is any effect of microenvironment on our drug effect and we would be able to see and report that. Uh, finally, I would like to thank my PI, uh, Dr. Sotapa Ray, for her guidance. I would like to thank uh, all members of Pediatric Cancer Research Group. I would also like to thank CHRI uh, to give me opportunity to present my work. And I would like to take any question if there are any. Thank you so much for sharing your work. I'm gonna wait just a couple of seconds, see if anyone is typing in a question. It certainly seems like this could be a promising treatment to decrease uh, and minimize side effects. I think that um, as a neonatologist, certainly medulloblastoma is not my specialty, but it would uh, seem like this could be an excellent adjunctive therapy if uh, continued um, studies um, support the data that you've presented today. All right, well, I'm not seeing any um, questions coming in. So thank you so much. And we will move on to our next presenter. All right, our next presenter is Jeffrey Keppel. Uh, Jeffrey, if you'd like to share your slides, that would be fantastic. Sounds good. All right. I think we're good to go, right? Looks great. Cool, thank you. <laughs> All right, so my name is Jeffrey Keppel. I'm a second year medical student at Creighton University, and I get the honor of presenting to you direct hyperbilirubinemia in infants with trisomy 13 and 18. So both trisomy 13 and 18 are genetic syndromes associated with numerous different anomalies like throughout their entire lifetime. Yet despite their recent increased survival time, Little is known about the hepatobiliary complications that occur in these patients. Clinically, we've seen an increased rate, a perceived increased rate of direct hyperbilirubinemia in these patients. So the goal of the study was to look at the incidence of direct hyperbilirubinemia and try to find an underlying etiology associated with these patients to try to understand their disease process a little bit better. In order to do this, we did a retro retrospective cohort study uh, we went all the way back to 2012 in order to include enough patients, and we went all the way up to March 1st, 2020, and we wanted to make sure that they obviously <clears throat> were diagnosed with trisomy 13 or 18, 
and that they were admitted to either the Children's Hospital Medical Center or the Nebraska Medical Center neonatal ICU. We did exclude any patients that were not admitted after the first month of life because we wanted to have that data kind of closer to the admission date and to kind of understand the underlying, underlying disease process. And we also <clears throat> excluded them if they had fewer than three bilirubin data points, just again, so we had enough data there. We did have two different definitions for a, a direct hyperbilirubinemia. We had a greater than one and greater than two presented in our paper. And the reason that we did this is the recent literature came out and said greater than one might be a better way to screen for direct hyperbilirubinemia in certain patient populations but greater than two was more associated with pathology in most patients. So we wanted to include both to be able to have increased translatability and be able to apply that to different situations. In terms of the data we collected, we, delay, we collected the demographics, different lab values, as well as nutrition, treatment, and imaging associated with these patients. When looking at the data, you can see that in trisomy 13, we had 13 patients included in the study and 22 trisomy 18 patients. In terms of the direct hyperbilirubinemia, we did see seven of the 13 trisomy 13 patients present with this for both the greater than two and the greater than one cutoffs. For trisomy 18, we did see five associated with the direct hyperbilirubinemia for trisomy, for trisomy 18 with the greater than two cutoff, but the greater than one cutoff included four additional patients in this. When looking at the timing of direct hyperbilirubinemia, when you can look at figure one, panel C and D, you can see that trisomy 13 tended to present a little bit sooner than trisomy 18. They tended to present within the first couple of weeks of life, where trisomy 18 was a little bit more variable and they presented within the first month of life. We also did not see any differences in direct hyperbilirubinemia when looking at gestational age, birth weight, male, I mean sex, as well as ethnicity. So none of those were a factor in determining direct hyperbilirubin in these patients. Also, we looked at TPN administration because this is a well-known cause of direct hyperbilirubinemia in these patients. So we wanted to make sure that factor was accounted for. We did see an increased rate of this in patients who received TPN. However, this difference was still the difference in direct hyperbilirubinemia was still present in patients who did not receive TPN. So this was not the only underlying ideology associated with them. Additionally, when we looked at the ultrasound findings for both the hepatobiliary and the cardiac complications that are present in these patients, we did not see anything significant in terms of a factor that caused the direct hyperbilirubin elevation in these patients. So we wanted to look further into this in future studies and be able to obtain biopsies and kind of understand a little bit more about the anatomy of these patients. Because with our small population, we were just not able to see enough information to make any judgment calls on this. Additionally, when looking at the GGT levels, we did see a elevated rate of GGT in trisomy 18 compared to 13. And we believe this kind of points to a different ideology of the direct hyperbilirubin elevation in trisomy 18 patients compared to trisomy 13. So this is yet another reason to kind of dig deeper into this and to kind of figure out what is going on to cause this in each of these patient populations. Because of all the data that we found, we recommend that with, we screen for direct hyperbilirubin elevation in these patients within the first week of life to kind of understand to make sure we catch all of them, but we also wanna make sure that we continue this up until four weeks of life because of the variability in presentation, or you wanna keep on screening until the stop of TPN. So whichever of those last two comes later. So we wanna be kind of on the safer side with that. In terms of future studies, we wanna make sure that we, like I said, understand the etiology of all of this. So we wanna be able to understand, like get biopsies and, have a greater patient population so we can make more conclusions associated with this, but we believe, we believe this is a good start in kind of understanding what is going on. And additionally, we also want to be able to understand the inpatient versus outpatient population with this. Our study only looked at inpatient, so we want to be able to expand that a little bit further and see if it was just our population that had this or if it's kind of a more sustainable work like across the entire trisomy 13 and 18 population. Uh, we also want to look into the long-term complications associated with direct hyperbilirubinemia in these patients and kind of understand how it impacts other complications that may be occurring and how it may impact the mortality associated with them. 
And that is all I have for you. Thank you for listening to me and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, again, I'll wait and see if anybody has any questions to text in. Um, I, I uh, wonder if you looked at any comorbidities in the two uh, patient populations to see if there were any associations with uh, hypoxic heart disease or severe respiratory needs, uh, code events, anything like that that could have led to uh, any liver injury. So we did look at the congenital cardiac malformations and try to see if there's any association with that. We did not find anything that was significant with that. In terms of the respiratory complications, I don't believe we looked very deep into that, but that is something that we could definitely look at in the future. We also did look into thyroid issues and there may be something associated with some of those patients where it may be causing some issues in the hepatobiliary system there, but it's something where we need, we just need more, a bigger population and kind of understand a little bit more of what is going on because for like 13 of trace to be 13 patients and 22 of 18 is just not quite enough to really see any general trends. So that's something definitely to look forward to. Well, I'd like to congratulate you on work well done, even though those uh, are small numbers for a clinical trial to um, be able to evaluate that many patients uh, with uh, the diagnosis of trisomy 13 and 18. Uh, is uh, a good sample size. So uh, congratulations, and we hope to see you again in the upcoming years uh, during your training. Thank you very much. All right, if you'll stop sharing, thank you. We will go on um, to Diego Gomez. Uh, Diego, please uh, go ahead and share your screen as well. All right, can everyone see this? It looks great. Wonderful. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Diego Gomez. I am a senior neuroscience major at Creighton University, and I'm going to briefly talk about my project titled Minor Anomalies of the Face in Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders. This was done under the mentorship of Dr. Omar Rahman and some funding from the NIH. So as a little bit of background, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders represent a continuum of characteristics found in individuals who have been prenatally exposed to alcohol. And there are four main characteristics that are associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. So those would include a neurobehavioral impairment, facial features, growth anomalies, so either height and or weight restrictions, and then some central nervous system anomalies. When we focus specifically on the facial features, there are three cardinal facial features, um, and these include a small palpebral fissures, a smooth philtrum, and a thin upper lip. The problem with these, and particularly with smooth uh, philtrum and the thin upper lip, is that they actually tend to fade with age. So diagnosis of this condition is best or most effectively done in the pediatric or you know, adolescent ages. Um, however, there are some other minor anomalies that have been associated with FASD, such as microcephaly, a low nasal bridge, epicanthal folds, minor ear anomalies, and micrognathia. Um, so just to get a sense uh, that this is a spectrum, so that means that it is comprised by four different uh, diagnostic categories. And so here we can see in this chart on the y-axis, the different diagnostic categories. So these would include full fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, um, partial fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder, and alcohol-related birth defects. And then on the x-axis, we're just seeing different criteria that need to be met. So we can see that as we go down the spectrum, there are less criteria that need to be met. So the hypothesis of the study was that we would be able to see other minor anomalies of the face beyond the three cardinal facial features uh, present in children along this FASD continuum. And we specifically focused on these five uh, anomalies. So strabismus, which refers to an, an abnormal alignment of the eyes. Uh, then we looked at ptosis, which is essentially a droopy eyelid. Epicanthal folds, this describes a fold that covers the inner eyelid or the inner canthus. Midface uh, hypoplasia, hypoplasia. And then lastly, uh, a flat nasal bridge. Uh, so this was a retrospective study, and we utilized data from the Fetal Alcohol uh, Syndrome Epidemiologic Research or Phaser database. So just so you get a sense of how this data is collected, um, so this is a research study that is conducted on all first grade uh, first graders, and so they uh, their height, their weight, and their head circumference is measured, 
and then they are handed off to a geneticist or a dysmorphologist who can assess their facial features. And then lastly, they undergo neurocognitive testing. So uh, this will distinguish the children who do have FAS versus those who do not. And then this arrow should actually come out of here. So the, the non-FASD controls would come out of here. And then lastly, a maternal interview is uh, conducted. And this just allows for verification of maternal uh, alcohol consumption during pregnancy. So we ended up employing two cohorts a North American uh, cohort as well as a South African one. And these would just be the cohort numbers for each, um, for each location. So when looking at our results over here, we're seeing the frequency of minor anomalies in the North American cohort specifically. So on the X axis, we're looking at the different diagnostic categories within the continuum. So F full FAS, partial FAS, AR and D, and lastly, our controls. And then in the different colors are just the frequencies of minor anomalies. And so we can see with most of these anomalies that there is a clear trend where most, um, uh, most of these anomalies are highest in the full FAS and then trend downwards uh, to the control. And so this is really um, an in interesting finding because, again, it could be used to, as a new diagnostic tool in diagnosing children with FASD. So um, all of these were found to be statistically significant when comparing all of the FASD continuum, so these three versus the control, but we still need to perform some additional uh, statistical analyses on this. And then when looking at the South African cohort, uh, we found a similar thing. So with mid-face hypoplasia, we found a downward trend. Uh, and we also observed that with the flat nasal bridge. Um, and interestingly, with epicanthal folds, we actually did not find any statistically significant uh, differences. And so we're different, definitely going to study some of those embryologic origins to understand why patients with AR and D who uh, typically do not present any uh, facial features are displaying similar levels of epicanthal folds as a patient with full FAS. So as our conclusions, um, we stated that ptosis and mid-face hypoplasia were found in decreasing frequency along the FASD continuum in both populations. And this was uh, actually found at a statistically significant level. However, strabismus, epicanthal folds, and flat nasal bridge did not trend in a significant manner. So the presence of key minor anomalies in FASD may represent novel diagnostic elements that could be employed for the FASD pediatric and adolescent population. And as I mentioned earlier, this is particularly important because because some of the cardinal facial features become less distinctive with age. Uh, so lastly, I would just uh, like to take a second to thank Dr. Omar Rahman. He has been my mentor and supported me in my research endeavors over the past uh, four years. So I'm actually graduating from college tomorrow and I will go attend the Mayo Clinic Medical School this fall. And it is all thanks to his uh, support and work. So thank you very much to everyone and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Diego, and congratulations both on your graduation and your upcoming matriculation uh, at medical school. Um, while we're waiting for other people to type in their questions, uh, what comes to mind is uh, that we're always interested in assessing and meeting the developmental needs of specific patient populations as early as possible. Uh, do you foresee as this research uh, continues and, it, and becomes more defined that this could lead to earlier diagnosis in addition to helping with the adolescent uh, patient diagnosis? Yeah, I'm not entirely sure about earlier diagnosis. I know that um, there is a lot of artificial intelligence that's being used to diagnose genetic conditions. So certainly if the, these were found to be reliable measures, um, for diagnostic purposes, they could be incorporated into, say, that algorithm, and you could just diagnose more people overall. Yeah. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate uh, you. your work and uh, your time uh, with us. Now we'll have a transition um, to our medicinal musings. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Knoll. Dr. Knoll is a third year pediatric resident. And last year, she introduced the idea of allowing medical scientists the opportunity to share their recent artistic projects during the Pediatric Research Forum under the program name of Medicinal Musings. This is the second year of Medicinal Musings and we are so thankful to Dr. Knoll for envisioning this addition to our forum and providing this creative outlet. This has been especially appreciated given the uncertainties and difficulties we have all experienced with the pandemic. Dr. Noll, will you say a few words about this year's entries in the judging panel? Yeah, hi, thank you, Dr. Anderson-Berry for that wonderful introduction. 
Um, briefly, Medicinal Musings, um, I was able to compile several judges, um, one for each of our categories, and then we actually had two judges for our pro section. Last year, we had approximately 20 submissions, and this year we doubled that um, with about 40 submissions across five different categories. To judge musical composition is um, soon to be Dr. Flannery Cunningham, who is actually a dear childhood friend and a fantastic composer and musicologist on the East Coast. Judging poetry is Steve Langen, who is a um, local poet here in the area and is very involved with the um, medical humanities community, both at UNO and at UNMC. Dr. Nina Fredericks is um, a Creighton University School of Medicine graduate who focused a lot of her undergraduate work and graduate in the arts and is judging our original art section. In prose, we have Kevin Clother and Jody Keisner. Um, they are both individuals I have worked with in different writing workshops throughout the community and both uh, are involved in the MFA um, and master's program at UNO and medical humanities. And then lastly, in photography, we have Rebecca Gratz, who is a multimedia specialist at UNO um, and had a longstanding position with the Omaha World Herald in photography. Thank you, Dr. Knoll. Now to the winners of the five medicinal musings categories. Uh, please bear in mind with me that this is a live announcement. So in order to not ruin the surprise, we were not able to confirm pronunciation of the winner's names. We apologize in advance for any mispronunciations and of course mean no disrespect. The winner in the musical composition category is Dr. Erin Clem. Yes, so Dr. Clem, uh, received this feedback from Flannery Cunningham about his truncus, the Odyssey piece. Aaron Clem uses the rhythmic hallmarks of the congenital heart condition, truncus arteriosus, to create a sonically rich percussion solo. Through the rhythmic motif of a heartbeat is a very old one. Clem breathes fresh life into it by his choice to convey a particular condition and the arrhythmias he incorporates. Throughout, Clem capably handles his source material, which leads him to a fresh rhythmic language, but which he is not unafraid to tweak where necessary to create musically persuasive phrases and form. Though brief, the piece is an exciting arc and explores the various pieces of the drum kit in turn to create a colorful and interesting evocation of this particular heartbeat. That's quite inspiring. I hope that um, urges everyone to go log on and listen to Dr. Clem's uh, composition. Congratulations. Uh, next, we'll move on to the category of original art. And our winner in original art is Dr. Arwa Nasser. Congratulations, Dr. Nasser. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Fredericks had this to say, although simply I think she um, captivates everything um, very clearly. The glimpse into the past year as a healthcare worker is compelling. Self-portraits are an opportunity for the viewer to see the artists as they see themselves. This self-portrait is particularly interesting in light of the trauma of the year. Although I should note, um, this was a portrait of an, another individual and I think it captures um, them very well. Again, congratulations to Dr. Nasser. Now we'll go on to the winner of the photography graphic design category. And we have congratulations for Ryan Corlett. Yes, so Rebecca Gratz had this to say, I found Ryan Corlett's graphic art submission titled Caring for the Carer, a moving depiction of the emotional and physical support medical professionals need just as they provide for their patients. Without showing faces, Corlett illustrates an intimate moment of care for the physician from, uh, from other, as well as a moment of introspection as the physician listens to their own heart. Well done. Excellent. And now the winner of the poetry category. We have congratulations for Denzel Matthew. Yes, Steve Langen had this to say about Pangea. Making the invisible visible is a rare gift and so exciting when it happens in the imagination. I feel a sense of privileged access as I'm led into the speaker's past through his mother's story, which is clearly part of the family lore. But this story, at least this time, goes deeper than that. 
I leave Pangea with a genuine hope and feeling that reshaping in its many forms is available when it's my turn. Okay, and moving on to our prose category, our last category, uh, we congratulate uh, Pooja Varman. Well done, Pooja. Yes, so both of our judges had lovely things to say. Um, Jody states, in a short essay, When We Cut Bodies, Varman questions the role of the physician's gaze, whether that gaze lands on a reluctant patient with a wavering smile or on a cadaver. Moving eloquently between medical jargon and lyrical description, Varma illustrates the violence that is sometimes inherent and in healing. Uh, and then Kevin Clother states, um, Varman recognized that the artist's role is to ask questions, not answer them. Varman's curiosity and humility come through powerfully in messages like the following. I struggle to reconcile my desire to respect the patient's agency with a recognition that bearing witness to discomfort was integral to my training to become a physician. How deeply must the medical gaze pierce before the gaze itself causes harm? I chose to stay in the room with the doctor and his patient, and that choice placed me in a long line of students learning, willing to learn from bodies shivering under thin hospital gowns. Thank you so much, Dr. Nall. Um, pretty inspiring uh, critiques of this amazing work. Uh, please refer to the slide for the continuing uh, education credit. And uh, in uh, my closing remarks, I'll remind you that if you're not yet a member of the Child Health Research Institute, please check out our website at unmc.edu backslash CHRI to learn more about the benefits awarded to members, including pediatric research office assistance, key collaborations with fellow members and access to CHRI funding opportunities. You can find out how to become a member on the site. Thank you again for joining us this evening for the trainee awards ceremony, wonderful keynote talks, and uh, we look forward to interacting with you virtually throughout this year's forum. And uh, we are hopeful that next year we will all gather in person to uh, celebrate our uh, research, our science, our advancement of child health and uh, additional medicinal musings and the honors pediatrics uh, projects, which can be seen this year on the award, uh, on the event website. Uh, the posters will be available to view at your leisure. Uh, there are no set poster sessions and the event website will be open until May 28th. Thank you so much for attending and have a lovely evening.